Well, we're back with the breakfast and our focus is on the Nigerian democratic system as we celebrate Democracy Day 23 years after. What are we looking at exactly? We have Nika Gule, who's a public affairs analyst, who joins the conversation. Nika Gule, it's good to have you join us this morning. Thank you very much for having me and good morning to our viewers. All right, then. Now, um, a, a bit of it, uh, we talk about, you know, the tenets of democracy. Uh, some people would say it includes the freedom of assembly, association, property right, freedom of religion, speech inclusiveness, equity, citizenship, consent of the governed, voting rights, freedom from unwarranted governmental deprivation of rights to life and liberty and minority rights. I mean, the list is almost endless. But I'd like to share your thoughts. How would you describe the Nigerian democratic system? Uh, th thank you very much for the question. I would describe Nigeria's democratic system as a journey. And the latest leg of the journey started 23 years ago in 1999. And progress has been made on the journey up to this moment. We are not where we want to be or where we should be, but the journey is on. And next year, 2023, is going to be very significant in terms of milestone. It will be epochal because we will have an opportunity to elect a new set of leaders at all levels as part of this journey. And I will say that what I am seeing in the Nigerian populace now is very hard for me. I think uh, the sing song on many people's lips now is the PVC. And the PVC, to me, even though is the P is permanent, permanent voters card, I, was, I will replace that P with people mm -hmm. and power. Because that is where our power lies as a people to be part of the democratic process. So I see the democratic process to be in four tires. So you have the executives, the legislat legislative, and the judicial arms of government. But the fourth tire is the people arm of government. And for a long time in this democratic journey, that fourth tire has been quiet has been docile, has been silent, but now there is a momentum, a wake-up call, sort of, of that fourth tire, which is the people coming into the democratic space. And I would say Nigeria would be the better for it. But, but, but just before we get to the people, you already understand that, you know, uh, politics actually takes place within the framework. So we're talking about the federal presidential system mm -hmm. and uh, a system where you have, uh, you know, the legislative arm of government. You also have the judiciary and the executive. I I'd like you to, you know, go through this now. H how would you describe, 23 years after and now, how would you describe, you know, the executive arm of government? This is the framework. So you have the executive, you have the judiciary, and you have the legislature. How would you describe? I, I would analyze the executive arm of government in this way. <clears throat> uh, we, we have had President Obasanjo, Yara Dua, Jonathan, Buhari. We have had four executive presidents in Nigeria since we started this leg of our democratic journey. And I will say that the executive arm of government have got a fade mark in my own assessment. And the reason why I give them fade is that the person who started the executive leg of the relay race, President Olusegun Obasanjo, I personally think we were unlucky to have him as the first person to begin that relay race. Because President Obasanjo, regardless of 
what people think or whatever good he would have delivered. He damaged our democracy. Have an issue. Because democracy thrives on certain pillars. The first pillar is the rule of law. The second pillar is the independence of the legislative and judicial arm of government. And of course, the fourth pillar is the, the, the application of the auto office and the constitution in the, man, in the management of the affairs of state. And President Obasanjo failed on all these counts, all of them. It was under President Obasanjo's eight years that the Supreme Court, the highest court in the land, will make a judicial pronouncement and then the Attorney General interprets that judgment in howsoever way he wants it and goes ahead to implement it. So it was like the Attorney General had the, the final say in judicial pronouncement. That damaged the judiciary. It was under President Obasanjo's government that the, the legislative arm of government was suppressed, was made to become an appendage of the presidency. You see, those who fashioned the presidential system of government that we are operating now, the United States, they knew that the executive arm of government is handed humongous powers. And when you hand the executive such powers, you need the legislative and the judicial arms of government to act as checks, as moderations to those powers. I mean, I, I tell people that this is akin to handing a driver a powerful car with the control of the accelerator. But then you give someone else the control of the brake pedal so that when this driver is pushing the accelerator too hard and the car is heading into the bush or into an accident, the person controlling the brake pedal slams on the brake pedal to slow down the car and give the driver control. This is the way it happens that the executive have the accelerator, the judiciary and the legislature have the brake pedal. But what President Obasanjo did, which has been copied by successive presidents to date, is that he first and foremost disabled that brake pedal. He made that brake pedal to be irrelevant, the brake pedal to be ineffective, that brake pedal to just become like his errand boys. And then he carried on with the affairs of state. And that is where we have found ourselves now. So President Obasanjo didn't rule with the rule of law. It was only him who will use three or four members of a state legislature and impeach a governor. Impeach a governor regardless of the court cases that were standing against such an action. It was President Obasanjo who will send soldiers to go and, and, and murder people in Odia and, and it's, as it happened in Zakibiam without any judicial process. So that leg of that journey, we started with President Obasanjo, has affected the executive arm of government till today. And from President Obasanjo, we got to President Yaradua. President Yaradua was different because he actually started on a very sound footing. He was trying to reverse some of the damage that President Obasanjo had caused to the executive arm of government. Unfortunately, President Yaradua was in poor health and he couldn't just see those reforms. He started on to fruition and he passed away. Onto the stage came President Jonathan. President Jonathan, in my own ranking, is somebody who was not prepared for the office of president. I think he got there by accident. He had these humongous powers, but he didn't even know how to use them. I, I mean, I, and at the end of the day, President Jonathan, as it was alleged, and as evidence showed, was not in control of affairs of state. 
Nekagule. Uh -huh. On to the scene. Yes. I mean, for the want of time, because we're just moving very fast, and you know how it can be. But um, quickly, I, I like you. I mean, there has been for the executive, because we're talking about a system uh, where the Nigerian politics operates, it operates in a framework. And if we're looking at the Nigerian democratic system, then we can talk about, you know, the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, and the people. In all of this, the question would be, where is the people? You, you, you have mentioned the shortfalls of uh, the executive arm of government during the 1999 uh, administration, democratic government, where you had the president of Lushibun Obasanjo. Where is the people? I mean, where do you count the people? How, how do you also have, because you said it's in strata, so you have the, 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 you know, the executive, the legislature, the judiciary, and the masses, the people. Where were there when all of this was going on? But away from that, quickly, can you tell us how you would rate the um, judicial, uh, the judiciary, and the legislative arm of government, which is a framework where a democratic system thrives? Thank you very much for that question. Before I answer your question, I would like to answer your question that the people have been absent. Majority of the people who go to vote are those who will most likely say their votes. The people who will most likely not say their votes have been absent in this process. And this is why we are calling on them now that if you are sitting in your fine house, in your posh estate, in your fine office, and you don't have your voter's card, you are deceiving yourself that you can do well when Nigeria is not doing well. It is better you step forward now, get your voter's card, with registration ending in the next 16 days, so that you can come into the process. You cannot allow the Orchins, the area boys, the Okada riders to be electing leaders for you. And then you will not be on WhatsApp and social media complaining for the next four years. Now, coming to the legislative. Uh, but but these persons are Nigerians. I mean, everyone is exercising the right. So, also, I mean, just a cotton. Uh, having a PVC does not translate into votes. Uh, you know, you can have a PVC does not mean that you have casted your vote. Or you're going to cast we your vote. Very, we are very correct. So this thing is in stages. Stage one now is that we are campaigning for these people to go and get their PVCs. Because if you don't have your PVC, you cannot step out to vote. And you will notice that from the 1st of July, after the close of the voters register, the messages will now begin to be targeted at those who have PVCs, that in February, March next year, you must come out and make your voices heard. Otherwise, we are going to get another set of bad leaders that we are going to complain and suffer with for the next four years. So now the, 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 the target, the focus is on get that PVC. And then from there, we are going to be talking about how to use it. Mm. Now, coming to um, the, the legislative arm of government, the legislative arm of government, picking up from where President Obasanjo started us off, started us on in 1999, have been in the pockets of the executives, whether the executives are the federal, state, or local government. You will see that for every president and governor since President Obasanjo, the first thing they want to do is they want to install the leader of the legislative arm of government. So that once they do, they have been given powers in the constitution to remove a sitting executive who is recalcitrant, who is not delivering good governance. And the, uh, the legislative arm of government in Nigeria at all levels have been muted. They have not exercised their powers. The, the, the executives routinely ignore them. And any attempt sometimes for the legislative arm of government to even exercise their constitutional powers, you see brigandage from the executive arm of government like locking up the Houses of Assembly or the National Assembly, beating up registrators, chasing them all over the place. And these are the kind of things that must stop. You know, when we come to the judicial arm of government, this arm of government, which is said to be the last hope of the common man, used to be very good. But 
with time and especially with what has happened in this democratic dispensation coming forward, this arm of government have also joined the executive and the judicial arms to be very corrupt. The, you see strange judgments now being given by the judicial arm of government because they have discovered probably that they were being left out of the party and they want to join the party. So judgments in Nigeria now are seeming to be uh, for the highest bidder because you cannot understand some of the judgments that this uh, uh, judicial arm of government is given. But in all of this, the people are the ones that hold the power. You see, the Constitution is very critical. The Constitution provides the people the power to recall, that is, impeach the legislative arm of government. So if an executive arm of government is holding the legislature hostage, the people must put pressure on that legislature to do their job. And if they don't want to do their job, then the people should start the recall process of the legislators. I can assure you that this current National Assembly that we have, that seems to be like puppets, if there is a recall proceeding in 109 senatorial districts, in 360 federal constituencies, to recall these members of National Assembly who have refused to do their job, I can assure you that something dramatic will happen in that National Assembly. And the same holds true for the states. So again, we're talking about the people. The people need to understand their rights. The people need to know that they have the power and we shouldn't just be on the sideline complaining, whinging and whining, but we should actually step into the political process, take our rightful uh, seats and drive this process forward. Hmm. But, but let's get to this one. It's been 23 years, I mean, after an un uninterrupted uh, democratic process. And some people are still saying that it is no longer nascent. But constantly we hear the president and, you know, the elites, the ruling class saying, uh, it's a nascent democracy. We're gradually getting there. At what point do we say that, hey, we're ripe for this? Now, we not agree that our democracy is nascent. After 23 years, even the American democracy that is 200 years plus, 23 years is 10% of that. So we, we, we should by now have developed this democracy to a point where it will be thriving. It will be delivering prosperity to Nigerians. It will be delivering good governance to Nigerians. But we have not got to that point yet. We are still at the point where uh, people are coming into political office, not with the intention of serving the people, of giving good governance for the people, but more like a business where they are coming in to make money that money legitimately, but no, make that money by looting the treasury, by bringing in grant looting schemes like fuel subsidy, foreign exchange subsidy, electricity subsidy, those kind of schemes where trillions of naira of Nigeria's money is being looted and unaccounted for. So that is where we are, that 23 years now, 23 years is a, is a long, long time. 23 years is a quarter of a person who will live 100 years. And you cannot say a quarter of a lifetime of a person should be thrown away and we are still calling it nascent. We are calling it nascent because we haven't done what we needed to do. Now, all that has happened in the past is gone, is history. What is left for us now is for the future. How are we going to correct this? How are we going to build our democracy and make it strong? How are we going to build strong institutions so that we are no longer looking at strong individuals? Nobody should be looking at President Buhari. We should be looking at the, the police. We should be looking at the, 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 the healthcare systems. We should be looking at uh, the military institution. We should be looking at the judicial institutions. We should be looking at those institutions, align those institutions to do their work. For instance, you have cases like a crime has been committed, and then you hear President Buhari ordering the, 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 the chief of defense staff and the service chiefs or the inspector general of police to go and do A, B, and C. That should not be. 
Once something happens, the institutions that are responsible for that, they should just get on with their work. They don't have to be acting as senior special assistants to the president. They, sh they shouldn't be acting as if they are an appendage of the presidency. Okay. They are an institution. Yes. Well, so, so the entire essence of Democracy Day seemed to be hinged on the 1993 annulled, uh, annulled elections. And uh, basically, do, do you think that we have learned any lessons? And what does that really mean that uh, prior to this time, you remember that, you know, May 29 has always been a Democracy Day for Nigerians. But, of course, it's been moved by the president 2018, you know, to June the 12th. And it feels like it's hinged on that election that happened in 1993. Free, fair and credible elections. Uh, what are your thoughts? Well, uh, I, I will answer this in two halves. On the positive side, I will say, yes, we have learned our lessons because for 23 years now, we have kept the military in the barracks and we have had civilians to pretend over the affairs of Nigeria. And we have had transition uh, from Obasanjo to Yaradua to Jonathan to, we have had four transitions. And we have even had the transition of a sitting president to uh, his opponent. So on that count, I will say that yes, we have learned lessons but then, on the conduct of free, fair, and credible elections, I would say that we have not learned much lessons from, from that one. Because the first two or three electoral cycles in Nigeria were all a sham. In fact, President Yaradua, when he was elected in 2007, he, he confirmed that he, he knows that the process that brought him into office was a sham. And he, he promised that he was going to embark on electoral reforms. You know, so on that basis, we have not been having credibility in our ele elections. But I have very firm faith in the 2022 electoral law. I think the 2022 electoral law with um, mechanisms like the electronic transmission of results is going to be very key in strengthening uh, the Independent National Electoral Commission um, making our elections to be very difficult to rig, you know, and that is what is going to engender confidence in Nigerians, especially the elite class, the educated uh, working class ones who have switched off from the electoral process, leaving only those who go to say their votes to be part of the process. It will engender confidence in them and bring them to Nika the ballot. Uh, and when it brings them to just the ballot, in, just in one the quality of candidates Nika will be different. Nika Gule, I mean, I'm being prompted to move away, and that's because we have to go. We've exhausted our time right here on this one. But just a quick one, because we're talking about the Nigerian democratic system, and we're also celebrating democracy uninterrupted 23 years and where we are right now. Now, big question has always been, if you look at other African countries, there seem to be, you know, cool, uh, counter-cool activities thriving. And then you ask what's going on. Nigeria is big brother of Africa. And people have constantly said, our democracy has nothing to write home about. Do you think that, you know, uh, having the worst form of democracy and having, you know, a military rule is something that we should consider? The military rule should never be considered at all. Because I personally believe that the military are a huge cause of the problems that we face in Nigeria today. Because the first thing the military do when they come into office is to suspend the constitution. And any country that is not being wrong with the rule of law is not going to make progress. And the other thing is that these coups are happening elsewhere in Africa because the politicians are giving the soldiers the reason for that. Nika Gule. And that is why in Nigeria we need to be careful. The, 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 the politicians need to deliver good governance so that they can continue to keep the military in the barracks. Thank that you so much. Nika Gule, message about that. we have to let you go. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts. You have raised very strong and resilient points right here this morning as Nigerians actually celebrate 23 years of civil war. Uh, we look forward to sharing more of your thoughts and the costs of the show. Thank you very much. Mr. I hope you have your voters card. I have mine.
Why not? I will show you at the next program. <laughs> oh, that's okay. <laughs> Many thanks uh, for being part of the issue. I mean, the, the conversation right here, it's important that you get your PVCs because, I mean, elections are not won by word of mouth and tweets. They're won by numbers. And so go out there, get your PVC, and be sure to go out and cast your vote for your favorite candidate. That's the size of a conversation this morning. When we return, it will be time for us to look at another uh, you know, major concern. We're looking at the equity state elections and, you know, the debate that just happened. Uh, looking at this candidate and the capacity, competence, uh, matching that with your switch. Stay with us.